Oh, oh, okay, okay. Also, the uh, Department of Mathematics at the UT in Oxford for the counter invitation, and this is my second time <laughs> to deliver a talk at the uh, uh, UT in Oxford, and uh, and uh, very uh, happy to see all my old friends in on Zoom and also new friends. And so uh, I'm I'm very happy to deliver this uh, lecture also and uh, lectures on GUI method because. I think this is like a growing uh, uh, is is a subject, and uh, it's uh, I think it's a uh, very useful technique. So what I hope is, and also that this method is still de developing, you know, into many different branches. So what I hope is after these five lectures, you may have a glimpse of what's you know the main technique, what's the main difficulty in this method, and. Uh, you can maybe apply this method to your problems. And uh, so, so what is GUI method? So uh, the main uh, theme uh, in my talk will be, I will introduce a so-called inner outer GUI uh, scheme for singularity formations in nonlinear PT problems. So what is the inner outer GUI? So the key idea, the inner outer GUI, is to zoom in the singular, singularity region and decouple the whole problem into problems in the into two problems. One is in the inner problem, which is only solved near the singularity and captures the essential geometric information, you know, identity information of the singularity. And the outer problem, which is solved in the whole space and the sums up all the global and the external effects. So this is a scheme that grows out, out of a so-called finite infinite uh, dimensional reduction method. So, and uh, in this five lectures, in the uh, first lecture, I would discuss the finite dimensional reduction method. So the model problem will be the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And that in the second lecture, I would de describe the infinite, infinite dimensional reduction method, okay? And the model problem will be the Allen Kang equation, okay, infinite dimensional reduction. And in the third lecture, I will discuss the parabolic GUI method, which is uh, something new in the last three years. And the, the model problem will be the energy critical heat equation. Okay? And uh, in my fourth lecture, I will discuss some new applications of uh, a GUI method for the, uh, for example, the oil in the flow. Okay, uh, and uh, and yeah, I have time. I will discuss the reverse green method. How to use the green method reverse? Okay, and the, the model problem will be again the the not an account equation, right? So let me start with the. So today I will talk about the, the baby reduction method. Okay, so a so lot of things will be very easy for you guys, and then you can take a life. You know, this, this is just an introduction to the, this is like a baby step, okay? I, like introduction, this, this kind of method, like, you know, uh, it's been done like more than 20 years ago, right? So, but I want to introduce this, just give you a simple idea, what is the reduction method? And uh, okay, this, so today will be very simple. Okay, so what is the finite dimensional reduction method? The idea is very simple, and uh, it is uh, it's grew out of uh, the so-called bifurcation theory. So suppose you want to solve a nonlinear equation. So write your nonlinear equation like s of u equals zero. Okay. Or by the way, if you have any question, please stop me uh, uh, anytime, and uh, I'll be very happy to answer. So we write, we suppose we want to solve this problem. And uh, so this is a uh, C1 by from X to Y, okay, some Banach space. So how do we solve the nonlinear equation? So a natural way is to find the approximate solution first, and then look for true solutions as a small perturbation of the approximation, right? So this is very, so for the, the example I'm going to have, for example, you, you can take this. Uh, uh, non-linear uh, non equation I'm going to take. So 
Suppose we have some approximate solutions and this approximate may depend on some parameter, right? So let me call this parameter space, this is called a configuration space, okay? And later we're going to say the configuration space can be points, can be interfaces, can be minimum surface, can be curves, can be many, many things, okay? So let's say this is the configuration space. And so we want to find a true solution. So we'll write our true solution as an approximate solution plus a small perturbation, right? So you don't just linear, linearization, this is very simple, okay? You, you do linearization and, and okay, you get the linearized operator, you get first order error, and you can run in the test. All this is very simple, right? This is very simple. Now, so if we want to, we want to solve this problem, right? So we, we take an inverse on both sides, right? We could try to invert the linear operator. So if the inverse, if the operator is uniform bounded, then we're done, okay? If the inverse is uniform bounded in suitable space, then we have a conjecture mapping and a fixed point and everything, everything works, okay? And so, so what, what is the reduction method? The reduction method deal with the situation when the linear operator is a free to form and is eigenspace function space associated to small eigenvalues has finite dimension. So in other words, the, the L, okay, the operator L is not invertible. And they're not invertible because you have small eigenvalues. But the number of the, the eigenfunctions correspond to small eigenfunctions is finite, okay? So later on, I'm going to discuss in my other four lectures, I will discuss the so-called infinite dimensional or pi green method. Now in that case, the eigenfunction space may be infinite and the operator L may not even be free to form, right? So, so, but what I'm gonna today will be the baby step. We assume the L is a free to form and we can, uh, the number, the, eigen, uh, the eigenspace number is, is a finite. So let's assume that we have n-dimensional eigenspace uh, for the small eigenvalues, and, okay? This is n-dimensional. So what we want, we will solve, we want to solve the problem into two steps. And the first step, you solve this, we solve the so-called projected nonlinear problem. So you solve the nonlinear equation, right? This is the nonlinear equation. But you solve the nonlinear equation up to some Lagrangian multiplier. Okay. And why do we have this Lagrangian multiplier? Because you want to restrict your space of function, which is orthogonal to the uh, uh, eigenfunctions. And this, this is how you get the Lagrangian multiplier. Okay. So this is the first step. And, and then in the second step, you solve the reducer problem. So you adjust your lambda in the configuration space so that you can find uh, some zeros right, of, of, of the Lagrangian multiplier. So, so this is the problem. This, this is how we're going to deal with the situation when the L has small eigenvalues, okay? We first solve the problem up to some Lagrangian multiplier, and then we want to prove we want to make the Lagrangian multiplier equal zero. So you, you do, do it in two steps, okay? So, so this is the, the baby, the, the, the reduction method. Now, this kind of reduction method was uh, first introduced by Flau and Weinstein in 86, and to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which I'm going to introduce today with some multiplication uh, recent modifi modifications, and the Jung and O generalized to high dimensional case. And uh, Barry Cohong developed the reduction method for the critical exponent problem. Okay. And, and then there are many, many new developments, uh, you know, some modifications, some new developments like 
Ambrosetti, McKelty, Barry Lee, and Ray, uh, and Vare, the Pino Firma Musso, and the Pino Classic Musso, and Gui and Wei, and Lin Li Wei, and Wei Yan, and Li Wei, and Xu, and so on. So, so, uh, so this is a this this is a short history. I'm sure that there are many many references are missing here. And uh, so, okay. So let me now start with the model problem, as I said before. And today I want to do the baby problem. Okay, I want to I want to just start the how, what is the basic reduction method. Okay, and what is the key ingredients in the reduction method. What well, this is what I'm going to introduce today. So I'm going to uh, start with the following model problem uh, to illustrate the idea, okay? So this is a non-linear Schrodinger problem, right? Very simple non-linear Schrodinger problem, right? Uh, epsilon square la plus u minus v of x u plus u to the power p equals zero. And we want to look for solutions that decay to zero. So, uh, this is called a Sonneton solution, right? So what are the assumptions on P we assume is a subcritical? And the assumption V, this, and, uh, and uh, let's just take the basic assumption V, which is C2 and uh, bounded from below and above. And you, you, can, you can have many variations, but let's do the simple case, okay? So the potential is bounded from below and above and uh, V and is C2. So let's first start, what is the approximate solution? What should be the building block? Suppose I fix a point P uh, in Rn, and I do this uh, with scanning, right? If I do this with scanning, then uh, this Epsilon square and disappear, and I have, I have this problem, right? And if I freeze my coefficient, yeah, if I assume if some equals zero, then this becomes a problem free of epsilon, and the v of p becomes constant, right? Okay, and and for this problem, we know the solution. We can write down the solution as a some rescaled version of the so-called W, which is the Sonnier term, right? Okay. So, and you can check. So this, this Sonneton solution, this solution has, uh, we're looking for a rigid symmetric solution for this Sonneton, okay? You can take a rigid symmetric, okay? Positive, and so this is called a ground state, right? Okay, and we have some basic property of this ground state. For example, it's unique. And we have this decay estimate, which is exponential decay. And it's non-degenerate. So if we linearize the operator, then the only bounded kernel are, 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 are translations, okay? So these are well-known facts, right? These are uh, well-known facts. Okay, so, so this is a problem we want to solve and we fix a point and, uh, and uh, we, we, this is our building block. So lambda is uh, V of P and you plug this in, you found what is the error. The error is V of P minus V of P plus Epsilon Y times W lambda Y. And W has exponential decay. So this is like Epsilon Y. So this, okay, this, this is a good solution. Right? This is a good uh, approximate solution. Right? So any problems, uh, any questions? All right, so similarly, if I take a K points, right? Okay, all right, K points, as long as the distance between these points much greater than Epsilon, then you, you still, the, it's, it's, it's an approximate solution, okay? It's, this is still very close, very, uh, very small. The error is also very small, okay? So, the question we want to ask, conversely, can we find a true solution to this problem with this property? Right? So this is what we want to do using the reduction method. We want to find a true solution. So these solutions are, 
this is approximate solutions, right? We want to find a true solution to this problem, okay? Uh, with this form. So this is what I'm going to do today. And, uh, and in, in this way, I'm going to introduce you what is the method of the reduction, reduction method. Okay, so let me now use a new formulation. Uh, instead of using uh, P plus Epsilon Y, let's call the Epsilon Y because I, want, I don't want to uh, 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 rescale just at one place. I want to rescale at all other places. So I, I take a Epsilon Y. So in this way, your P becomes a P prime. Okay, this is just some notation. Okay? So lambda J is uh, V of PJ and the W, Big WJ is uh, WJ X PJ prime, and and this is my approximate solution. Okay, this is uh, my uh, my approximate solution. Okay, so what is my configuration space? I take I assume that all the points are okay. They are uh, far away from Epsilon, uh, away from each each other. So I take I look for solution of this. Okay, sum of WJ plus a small term, and what I linearize, okay. And this is my linearized operator. And this is my, uh, the error. And this is the nonlinear term, okay. So but just so very simple, okay. Just linearize around the cons around the, the, this approximate solutions. Now, the linear, for the linear, uh, the linear operator at each point, okay, uh, uh, I have the, 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 uh, the translation, okay, around the Y, okay, solves the linear operator. So solve the linear operator as the frozen coefficient. So if you're plugging in the CJI in, the universe operator is also very small, okay? Right. So, so this, this is like approximate eigenfunction, the small eigenfunction. This is not exactly small eigenfunctions, but the approximate small eigen, eigenfunctions, okay? Because one of the small eigenfunctions. And that's good enough, okay? This is good enough. All right, so let's now recall there are two steps uh, for the reduction method. Okay, the first step, I fix a P in the configuration space. I found a pair of phi P and CP such that uh, I can solve the problem after the Lagrangian multiply. And then in the second step, I solve the reduced problem, okay? By adjusting the P in the configuration space, I will solve the reduced problem, okay? Now in the first step, I don't need any, any special property of the potential free, okay? And the potential free, the, the role of a potential free will come in the second step, okay? In the first step is, is for any free, any potential, okay? So let me solve the first step, okay? How we solve the first step? And then, uh, uh, we're going to see how we're going to solve the second step. What are methods to solve the second step? Okay. So, so, uh, <clears throat> so to solve the first step, let's first solve the linearized project problem. See, so otherwise, I solve the problem without, without the nonlinear term. Okay. Let's forget about the nonlinear term. Okay. So we solve the linearized problem. So this is a linear problem. Okay. Now, to solve this problem, the, this C, okay, then the, the, this C, okay, is nothing about your project, right, the left hand side into the eigen, eigenspace, your project. And you can compute what is CJI, okay? Because all these functions, this space, they're almost diagonal, okay? They're almost orthogonal to each other. Okay, almost all, all talking to each other. So we just need to compute the left hand side. Now, in the left hand side, you can do integration by pass. Okay, remember this guy is almost a kernel, okay, almost uh, small, right? So integration by pass, 
and what you get is 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 uh, is uh, is the difference between the phase coefficient and the potential v, and then you have this, and the plus g, and <clears throat> and uh, so what you found is the the Lagrange multiply can be controlled by phi itself and by g. Okay, this is the uh, uh, first step. So. The Lagrange node, so if phi is small, then Lagrange multiply will be small. Okay. Now we need a more precise estimate. And uh, you do so, and uh, you use the some exponential decay of the of the W, and you find this term is small and even has some exponential decay. And and uh, and uh, and uh, for for uh, and uh, the 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 spikes they were inter, they have interactions okay so how do those interactions you decompose the interaction into two parts one is the one near your point okay you near your point and your uh for example near near the j point then double l will be less than to double j and away from the j point and then you just use the exponential decay okay just use the exponential decay. So what you get is this estimate, which says the Lagrange multiply cannot only be controlled by phi and g, but it can also be controlled by phi with <laughs> some smaller term. And this is important because later we're going to do the, 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 the contradiction argument. So this takes of uh, take care of the, the Lagrange multiply. Okay, so for the universal project, projected problem, uh, we have existence and the uniqueness. So if you have uh, uh, a, a PJ, which on the configuration space, then we can find a unique solution to the linearized projected problem. Okay, and with this up here estimate. Okay, and this map is called the T. Okay, you give a G, I, I can solve, I can give you a phi. Okay, give a G, I give you a phi. Now, now for this problem, the phi is unique. Okay, you, you find, and in other problems later, we're going to say you may not get a unique phi. You can only pick up one phi, one good phi. And in other problems, we're going to say, but for this problem, this is a unique phi. Okay, you find a unique phi. So, so, so we, so this is how we solve the linearized uh, project project problem. So how to solve this problem? Okay, how to solve this problem? Okay, we first prove up here estimates. Right? Okay, this is the key. Once you prove up here estimates, as so we're going to say existence will follow from up here estimates. Okay. So, now. Uh, we, we assume it's not true, right? So we can make normalize so that phi is like a one and the g goes to zero. Okay, and this is our problem. And we know, and because, because our estimate, then the Lagrange multiply also goes to zero. Okay, so uh, to prove the RPM, RPM estimates, we do two parts. One is the inner estimate, and now one is the outer estimate. So for the inner estimate, suppose my maximum is at 10 at some uh, PJ, okay? Uh, in, a, in a bounded region, right? PJ zero and R, okay? And then you do a rescaling. <clears throat> you, you shift your point to the PJ zero. And, and, uh, and then uh, by elliptic estimate, and uh, so you then, then phi n will, will have will converge to some limit of phi, right? And then, then the phi tilt, the limit will solve, will be linearized, will solve the linearized problem, okay? With the freeze coefficient and with this uh, uh, was of any condition, right? But now, since phi tilt, uh, since we know the non-degeneracy of the problem, right? So, and this is not possible, right? 
right? This is not possible. So, so this proves the inner estimate and, and this, uh, so here we just need uh, the non-degeneracy, right? This is very simple, right? Now, for the outer estimate, okay? So let's proof. Now we have uh, at each spike, I, at some fixed distance, phi n goes to zero. Now I want to show the globally phi n goes to zero, okay? Now, so let's look at the outer problem. So the outer problem, the outer equation would be like na plus minus one. And let's think about it's like na plus minus one, okay? Now, what do we know? The phi n is small in this, you, in this, on this boundary, and the phi n is bounded far away, okay? So now I, I, I want to show phi n actually goes to zero everywhere, okay? Uh, goes to zero everywhere. So how do we show this? I use a barrier. So what is my barrier? I choose an exponential function uh, as my barrier. A positive power, okay? And, and uh, with some boundary data here, right? And you can check that the exponential function is a barrier as long as your sigma is small, okay? You take your exponential, so this function is your barrier. Now, and, and you check that this satisfies this is a barrier. And at the infinity, at the at fair at the infinity as x goes to infinity, you you x go to infinity, this goes to infinity, right? And your phi n is just bounded. So this so this one bounds, this one bounds your phi n at the infinity as well. Okay. So then by maximum principle, you have phi n at less than to phi bar. Okay. And then we can take data go to zero. And then so we get a phi n just nesting to this, and which is small. So, so this shows that outside phi n is actually, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is small as well, right? This is a barrier argument. And in fact, if you have de more decay, for example, if your GN decays, okay, like exponentially, then you can choose this kind of barrier, right? You can choose again that, this I don't change, it's just exponential large, but I can put a barrier, a mu n times a barrier, okay, exponential small. And I do the same proof, okay, just do the same proof. Then I will get the, the fully upper estimates. So I can get exponential decay for my solution as well. Even my right hand side has exponential decay. Right? And, and, and uh, so, so this exponential decay is important because it's helpful for, for the compactness argument. Yeah. So uh, any questions, any remarks before I go on? These are the very simple, uh, okay, PD, okay. So what I have is, uh, is the RPA estimate. So, so proof of the RPA estimate. Now, once you prove after estimates, I want to say, okay, you have existence right away, right? Because basically, there's a fixed ball, okay, BR, and and uh, we we take a weak formulation, we solve the problem in H1B, okay, All right? So, so, so this is the weak formulation of the linearized problem. So the weak formulation of the linearized problem, right? Uh, and uh, by density argument, then <clears throat> phi will solve I, 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 I weak is a weak solution, right? For, for, uh, for this problem, right? And then by, by, by regularity, you have L infinity. So, so, so and we, by upper estimates, we get L, L infinity. So, and to prove the existence, you just use the weak formulation of the problem, right, the free formulation, right? The, re, the right of weak formulation is the H1 norm. You use the H1 norm. So you write as a phi plus B phi. What is B? B is a Laplace plus V to the inverse, okay? And this is a compact operator. And because W is a decay, 
right? That one has a decay. So this one is a compact or fader. And so by, and you just use the freedom alternative, right? Which says, if you want to uh, solve the problem for any G tilter, what you need to check is your, if you, the only solution, the, the solution is uh, inevitable, right? It's one-to-one, -one, right? the problem is one-to-one. -one. But if G tilter is zero, then our upper estimate says phi is also zero, right? So, so you get existence right away from the upper estimates. Okay, so once you don't ask for MS in, in any ball, right? But our, our upper estimate does not depend on the ball, on the size of the ball. As the, the ball goes to infinity, and then you can exhaust all balls, all Rn, all cells in Rn, and then you get a solution in, in the whole space, right? So, so this gets an existence. So, and now, after you got an existence, the next thing we want to check is the Lipschitz regularity uh, of the of this mic. Right? Now this is important because of the, in the later uh, argument. So how do we choose the Lipschitz uh, regularity? So we know that L infinity estimate. Okay. Now we want to estimate the derivative the, the, of this operator with respect to your prime type P. So if we do a formal, di formal differentiation, then the, this, th so this is our solution, right? Pro linear projective problem. And the formal differentiation, and this, this is our, our formal differentiation. And what we need to check is, is that this formal differentiation gives us a, a bounded solution, right? A bounded and also small solution, right? So how do we do this? Okay, and and what we need to project the, the the differentiation into the small candle as well. Okay, into the eigenspace, and you just do integration by pass, and then you're going to get this is also bounded. And and uh, and then you project uh, the 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 differentiation into the small eigenspace and uh, and the eigenspace. And then you can just use the L infinity theory with the final part. Okay? So, so this is a form argument, right? We just form it, we differentiate the problem with the square P, and we, we use our RPL estimate. Okay. Right? This is a form argument. But you can make this form argument rigorous. What you can do is just do discretization, right? You take it P and the P plus H. And then do a difference of the equation, and then you show that you know the the differentiation, the difference equation. You you do you do formal you know discretization and take a limit in H, and then you get uh, C one. Okay, you get uh, this is C one. So anyway, anyway, you that lots of things you need to do you know to prove the Lipschitz, but uh, this is uh, uh, you can get uh, this estimate. Okay, Lipschitz, uh, your map is also Lipschitz. Uh, Okay, so once you get the linear project problem, and then you let's now include the nonlinear, right? So what you do is just a fixed point of theory because you already found a good inference, right? And now you just go to the, the first page I told you, if your L has a bounded inverse, you are done, right? This one, we want to solve the linear problem. The linear problem has a bounded inverse. So you just use a fixed point and you are done, right? So, so the nonlinear projected problem you are done. So, so this is the first step. Now, you can also check that the nonlinear problem is also Lipschitz, okay? You have to do some Lipschitz theory and uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a tedious, but uh, uh, so this finishes the first step. Uh, any questions in the first step? Any remarks? Um, maybe I yeah. ask a question. Yeah. Uh, sorry for that. Turn the off. Either. Yeah. Before the make, make sure I understand it. So yeah. They, it looks like you you distinguish the at the beginning you distinguish the uh, 
what is a uh, Schrodinger with yeah. uh, Anand Ka. And uh, yeah. seems that maybe it's a, for the most of you guys is a trivia. For the Schrodinger, you, you, you're talking about the finite dimension uh, yeah, case. Yeah. yeah. But, but the but the other one is uh, is, is that obvious? Oh yeah, yeah. Because uh, the the for the Schrodinger is uh, is uh, the the is a soliton which are spike uh, points, right? But the Allen Kang is an interface, right? Yeah. So which is the infinite dimension. So I will talk about Allen Kang next week. Yeah. Yeah. The, can can I understand is because the uh, the Schrodinger is a dispersing dis dispersive weight equation. The other one is a dissipative equation. Dissipative equation. Oh, now you don't have time. <laughs> no. It, it, does that make sense to you? <laughs> and it's that way. Uh, okay. Uh, I know this doesn't make sense to me because uh, from our point of view, the the this is a point of singularity, but the Anakin is uh, is uh, interface of singularity, which is infinite dimension. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So the dispersivity and the dissipativity doesn't make any difference. No, no, okay. It makes a difference in the, in the outer estimate. Oh, in the outer estimate, we use the dissipative, right? We use maximum gotcha. principle. We use okay. the maximum principle. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now we could do a second step. We solve the reduce problem, right? So, okay, so, so you said that in the first step, I don't use any property of V. V is very arbitrary, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's uh, very rough, very arbitrary. Now in the second step, I want to solve the reduce problem. So there are two ways to solve. One is just a direct method. Another one is a vibrational reduction method. So let me just describe the first method. So in the first direct method, you, what you can, I, uh, if you have non degenerate critical point, then you can construct the solution. Right. Okay. And so how do we do that? Okay, you just compute what is what is the Nagwanti multiply. Right? You multiply both sides by the kernel, okay? And then you compute the Nagwanji multiply. And you find that the Nagwanji multiply in the leading order is just the gradient of V. Right? This is just a simple computation. So if you're V has a non-degenerate critical point, then your perturbation is also a non also give your I, I, I critical point, right? So this is just an implicit function theorem, and, and you are done, okay? And this is what original uh, Flau Weinstein and uh, Yung Gung all did, okay? So if a non-degenerate critical point, you, you get your solution. Right? And the second method uh, is quite uh, useful, is called the uh, vibrational reduction. So if your problem has a vibrational structure, then you don't need a non-degeneracy, okay? So what you do, uh, you define the, your energy functional, your, because you have an energy structure. And uh, so you just need to find a critical point of this energy function, okay? And and there's a very useful, the called five, we call a vibrational reduction principle, uh, which says, okay, suppose this is the problem I solved, right, by the step one. Now, if I have a problem, uh, I solved the problem uh, by step one. So I fix, uh, I fix, I, I spike, I solve uh, the, the remainder with respect to spike, right? And then, uh, then this is a critical point, a solution, okay, to the original problem. If or only if this is a critical point of this reduced function, right? Uh, let me do the proof. The proof is quite simple. You just compute, you compute the derivative of the reduced functional, and you get this, okay? So, and you can show that this is a diagonally dominated matrix. So. This equals zero, and if you, only if all the C i j equals zero. So, 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 so you, what you reduce is to compute the critical point of a reduced function, right? And so you can discuss, we can discuss several applications of this reduction principle. For example, this is the Pino Fermat, right? If you have 
uh, 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 no minima, okay? Then you can construct a solution, right? And if you have local maximum or disjoint, multiple, okay? You can also construct a solution. And then there's also an uh, interesting uh, with Kong I did, uh, if you have a local maximum, just one point, local maximum point, you can construct arbitrarily many spikes around the local maximum point, okay? So how to prove all this result? You just compute the reduced functional and uh, you, and the reduced functional you compute and then using the, uh, 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 the fact that this is a solution and you just get the, 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 uh, the, the second water term. And so the reduced uh, energy functional is nothing but just the V, okay? Just the potential V. So, so, so your reduced functional is nothing but in the leading water is some power of your potential V. Okay, and then you just use the vision method and you find a minimum, okay, and the multiple maximum and a, a, a multiple minimum as well, okay. Now, in the, uh, if you have uh, multiple, okay, uh, uh, interacting spikes, okay, if spikes, they're all very close to each other, then you need to compute the interaction. And it turns out that you can compute the interaction. That the interaction is like is this form. This is the interaction. Okay. And uh, uh, so now, and then you just come, you just design a suitable configuration space. And uh, okay, and then you just maximize your reduced energy functional in this re uh, configuration space, and you can find a critical point in this. Uh, uh, in this configuration space. So the proof will become much easier and you get many, many solutions for this uh, nonlinear shooting equation. But this reduce, uh, if your problem has okay, five vision structure, right? Okay, so uh, maybe uh, summarize the, the key uh, takeaways from this uh, 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 from this uh, baby okay, reduction method, okay? So the, 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 this reduction method works for five-rational or non-five-rational. We don't care five-rational or non-five-rational. Especially in the first step, I don't care if the problem is non-five-rational or non-five-rational, okay? The first ingredient you need is the non-degeneracy of your building block, okay? And once you know the non-degeneracy of a building block, you can do this. Easily do this, uh, uh. and the, the the so in the first step, the key argument is RPA estimate, right? If you have RPA estimates for your linear linearized problem, you are basically done. You have existence and the uniqueness. You have everything in the first step. Okay, so RPA estimates is the most important, right? And the RPA to pro RPA estimates there are two parts. The inner part. We use the also identity condition, and the outer part you use the the global property, the maximum principle or other things. Okay. Now, so in the second talk, in the talk I'm going to talk about next week. So we're going to for the up here as we're going to have we're going to use the so called in the outer green, and so so this in the outer green. It grows out of this consideration. It's the inner problem and the outer problem. Really, we have to divide the problem into two parts, the inner problem and the outer problem. And, and uh, to solve the reduced problem, you can use many new techniques from critical point theory, integral system. And okay, uh, uh, I, I will discuss some, I will just mention some other re reduction problems. For example, the, uh, the so-called linear target type, right? Uh, okay, this has been studied by many, many people, right? And then the Brazil's Nimberg type, right? And the Tananti bubble, right? The building block will be the Tananti bubble, which is shown to be uh, non-degenerate. So you have Barini and the Ray and the Ray and the, the Pinot Femme muscle, 
and uh, we have uh, with uh, Yen Li, we have very refined uh, inner estimate, okay, for, for this type of problem. And there was also, you can also this uh, for two dimension, there's a new wheel type, right? This is, uh, uh, this was developed by the Pino Kwasik and the Musso in 2005. And then there's also Ginzmananda type, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and the non-degeneracy has been proved by the Pino Firma and the Kwasik, and the reduction has been developed by the Pino Kwasik and the Musso. So in 2D, there's some special difficulties in the linear problem. Okay? You need to solve the linear problem, okay? Uh, uh, so I will not, since my time is limited, I will not discuss uh, this. Okay. Are there any questions? Or uh, what, what is the plan? Talk. We, I stop here where we- yeah, I yeah, can... the, Your time is almost over. So we have okay. two minutes, so we can stop okay. if you want. Okay, yeah? okay. Yeah, yeah, I stop here. Next time I will discuss some application of this finite dimension reduction, uh, including the most, my re most recent paper I posted online like two days ago. I use this method uh, to give the optimal uh, quantitative estimate for the strewy decomposition. You know, the, so, and then after I talk about the application of this finite dimension reduction, uh, then uh, next week I will talk about infinite dimension reduction I would say how we're going to deal with Alan Kang, okay? How we're going to use do this method for Alan Kang and to say the infinite dimensional reduction for interfaces. Yeah. All right. So thank you, Jung Ching Wei, a lot for a very nice lecture. Uh, I think 